Do you have the Irish Antonio team talking about the tapes? Same as yours. of this problem, our team was really inspired by the discovery of Indianella sacchiensis in 2016. This microbe is actually capable of surviving on PET as a carbon source. Um, so as you can see in this graph um, at right here, after about approximately 40 days, uh, this microbe is capable of degrading low crystallinity PET film. So one of the sort of in inspirational things that was discovered by the Yoshida et al. team is that there is actually an extracellular um, plastic degradation pathway. So what it first happens in this pathway is there's an extracellularly secreted enzyme, PETase, which breaks the polymer down into these monomers of MHPT and TBA. This is followed by a secondary degradation step where another enzyme, MHPTase, breaks down those monomers into TBA and that is taken into the cell um, through a transporter and it enters central carbon metabolism. So given the importance of the very first step of the enzymatic pathway actually breaking down the film into a bunch of different, different monomers that can be used for the metabolism of the bacteria, we were looking to see if this could potentially be used as a microbial degradation strategy. We were further inspired by a team in the United States, Austin et al., which basically found in 2018 you can make two mutations to the active site, which results in a narrowing similar to a thermofibida cutinase, um, and it results in an increase in catalytic activity approximately twofold. So, um, ba based on these two amazing observations in the literature, we are hoping to, to implement this project as um, IGEM Toronto is itself, and then we'll take you through our story of how we determine our implementation goals and work from there. All right, so our first thought was to um, create some kind of consumer available product that would um, use this reaction. Um, so our human practices team went to the industry. We um, first off started at UOT and talked to Brendan Stranos. Um, his two major points were that um, mechanical recycling is, um, uh, like, um, sorry, it's one of the problems with it is that contamination makes it so that it's hard to um, use the system. And then the other is that um, our consumer available product wasn't really the best way to um, go about this, and he suggested an industrial application. He gave us contact in the city of Toronto as a whole, and um, they were experts on this industrial application. They told us that we should consider its implementation in a closed system, and that we should um, make sure that we're purifying our um, byproducts, which are TPA and ethylene glycol. Um, so then we talked to Dan Lance, who is an expert in the industry. Um, he said that the industry is definitely interested in sustainable processes. And then he told us that um, chemical recycling would be selectable express, and especially, um, um, they, they really like that because um, mechanical recycling, um, you can only really send it through about seven times, whereas with chemical recycling, you can send it through um, indefinitely. Um, and so coming out of these conversations, we had three major implementation goals. The first was to design a bioreactor. The second was to address this issue of contamination. And the third was to optimize pet days for catalytic ability and thermostability. So guided by expert opinion, we designed a bioreactor to extract the useful components of uh, TPA and ethylene glycol. So our first tank is where all the enzymatic reactions occur, uh, where we have the engineered E. coli with the pedase um, and other enzymes in the nutrition media, followed by uh, dilution and precipitation, you finally uh, distill the useful product of ethylene glycol. So we modeled the system using the kalis menten kinetics and systems of ordinary differential equations. So in order for a bioreactor to work efficiently, we need to address two properties of enzymes. 
We need to first optimize its thermal stability and then its catalytic activity. So for each of these optimization problems, we're going to have various approaches, um, genetic algorithm, recurrent neural network, transfer learning, and uh, rational design all come together to engineer uh, better pedics. So first, let's talk about thermal stability. All our models are essentially variations on the same theme, and that is a generative discriminative model. So first, we have a generative model, which is able to generate new protein sequences based on sequences as seen before. In this case, it's a genetic algorithm that will optimize the hydrophobicity of the protein sequence. Then, we're going to have a discriminative model. The, goal, uh, the, the job of that is to, um, given the protein sequence, it is able to tell you whether or not that sequence is a hydrophobicity. And the point of that is when you're optimizing for hydrophobicity, you want to ensure that all your optimized sequences do not fall into unreasonable places of protein sequence space, essentially acting as guardrails of your optimization algorithm. So here's the results of our discriminative model. The diagonal line here shows a pretty good accuracy of predictions. So you can see the true class on the left, on the vertical, and its predictions. In particular, the first row and the first column indicate the accuracy of hydrolytes, of which PEDES is a member. So the overall model here achieved an accuracy of 92%. Now let's talk about catalytic activity. It's essentially the same um, similar algorithm. The only difference is that we're going to modify the training set um, of which the generated, uh, degenerated model is trained on. So you're going to generate sequences, you score them, and then you modify the training set for the generative model. So let's talk about the generative model. For that, we're going to use a recurrent neural network, or RNN. This is what it looks like, and this is what it can do. In 2015, Andre Carpathy did an experiment where he trained an RNN with Linux source code and asked it to generate new code. So this is generated code. So don't really pay attention to the words, but look at the structure. So the RNN was actually able to preserve syntax and capture structure and uh, patterns in sequence. So what does this have to do with proteins? Well, in industry, RNNs are generally used for chatbots. So say you want to predict this red word here, you would actually need to know the tense of a word that came many words before it. And this is a concept known as long-term dependencies. So in proteins, amino acids far apart in primary sequence might actually be really close together in 3D space. So we're going to use an RNN to generate and predict next amino acids um, and to learn, perhaps, the patterns and syntax of the language of proteins. Uh, okay, now we're going to have a discriminative model. So this is part two. The problem with this is that it's really difficult to do a machine learning model when you have very little data. And this is the case here. So the chaotic behavior of these yellow points, the validation loss, uh, sorry, these orange points, indicate that this model is not good at generalizing generalizing to unseen protein sequences. This is because we have very little data. So rather than just giving up, we decided to try transfer learning. Transfer learning is this idea of applying knowledge learned from one domain to another, usually one that has very little data. And a field that has experienced great success using this technique is computer vision, where they diagnose diseases um, using um, neural networks, but they don't have a lot of data but you do have a lot of cat pictures online. So you can train your neural network on cat pictures, and then the first few layers are gonna detect edges, curves, textures. You're gonna reuse those neurons and fine tune the later neurons um, for your particular problem. So recall this is the loss for um, our discriminative model without transfer learning. After we apply transfer learning, we get a much better looking curve, much better, much controlled, uh, very controlled, and a good indicator that the validation loss um, is it, able to generalize to unseen <coughs> protein sequences. So this was trained on 58,000 GFP sequences and then fine-tuned for headaches. So we apply transfer learning to that uh, the last layers of the discriminative model, and this is one of the results. So the top line is the mutant generated by the algorithm, and the bottom one is the wild type. The important thing to note here is that this sequence only has 22.4% sequence identity. And what's really interesting 
is that this model is able to explore regions of protein sequence space otherwise unreachable by directed evolution alone. So how, the, how well this sequence performs experimentally, uh, you will find out in five minutes. All right, uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the rational design approach used by one of our dry lab members, Dimitri. So going along with this sort of interest in exploring aspects of the protein space that are not accessible by directed evolution, we chose to use an algorithm called FunClip, um, which basically it, uh, generates multi-point mutations rather than the single traditional biochemistry where you mutate two amino acids at a time to see if it has a better effect on catalytic activity or thermal stability. So importantly, what this member first did um, is looked at the entire polymer chain um, and how that interacts with the backbone in order to pick the best sites um, for the Spunklib uh, algorithm to basically optimize. So this goes back to the actual catalytic mechanism of the petase enzyme itself. Um, what's important here is that it doesn't just have a single site with catalytic activity, it actually has a secondary subsite that's responsible for binding many of the, of the um, single monomers of the polymer chain, which results in the generation of many different products. So if you're only looking from a traditional biochemistry sense about which um, amino acids are closest to the active site, you may miss other mutations that are important for stabilizing the polymer chain um, and increasing activity of the enzyme. Uh, so the way that FunClib works is it's an algorithm that was developed by um, a bunch of computer scientists that, eventually, that essentially uses a position-specific scoring matrix to first compare the evolutionary conservation of the sites that you input into the model. Um, after that, it scores those based on their stability and does an exhaustive enumeration in Rosetta, um, which essentially looks at um, the stability of those mutations after you look at all the row numbers of the amino acids that are selected. Then it clusters those by those that have the lowest energy um, and essentially puts an output of approximately 600 sequences, which you can then test in the wet lab. Um, as we know that that is far too many sequences to do in a single summer, um, our members subsequently developed an algorithm to try to choose from that algorithm which sites are actually best to look at. So uh, he took a score at each amino acid position that was first fed into the model, um, and, he, and, it was and the best score was defined as the frequency of that amino acid substitution over the total number of student substitutions at, uh, multiplied by the site substitution frequency of that amino acid. So doing this model, um, he then looked at these in flex DDG to basically look at how those affect um, the interaction of the polymer chain with the enzyme itself. So overall, that gave us five different petase variants to test against the wild type enzyme and the best known mutant available in the literature. So as you can see, these are the amino acid substitutions and the part numbers to refer to on the registry. So how did we go about uh, ex experimentally validating these variants? Um, so one of the first limitations that we had to overcome is the fact that petase actually has two disulfide bonds that are essential to its thermal stability. So because we didn't have access to a bacterial strain with an oxidizing cytoplasm, we had to think of another strategy um, to enable the correct folding of this enzyme and effectivity. Um, for this, we chose the vector PET22B because it contains a PEL-B leader sequence, which enables expression in the periplasm where those disulfide bonds can be formed. Um, importantly, it also has a, hist a hexahistidine tag in the vector, which enables nickel uh, column protein purification. So, our workflow was essentially growing up bacteria containing these plasmas with our petase variants, um, inducing expression of the enzyme with IPTG, um, a series of centrifugation and sonication steps to recover the enzyme itself, and then finally um, running the supernatants containing our petase variants on a column, um, which basically the nickel column results in binding to the histidine tag um, and then eventually pull down and dilution that enzyme. Um, so initially, we were doing this in the BL21 background, which is a very common protein production strain. However, we found that we were continuously pulling down RNA and SLID, which end up binding to the nickel resin. Um, as we perceived, uh, as this could convolute uh, further assessments of enzymatic activity by biasing our understanding of the concentration, we turned to a lobster strain, which has mutations in both of these um, enzymes and prevent them from binding to a nickel column. So as you can see, we have successfully um, isolated PETAs, which has a uh, molecular weight of 30 kilodaltons, and as you can see, the elution profile on the right demonstrates um, is approximately the same between the two. 
Um, so finally, how are we going to analyze these variants? We're using a p-nitrophenyl butyrate assay because it's a very simple spectrophotometric method. But in order to understand how this assay works, you first have to understand the mechanism by which um, PETase is actually cleaving plastic. So first, you have the substrate that enters this binding cleft. Um, it, it, the carbonyl is stabilized in the active site and the oxyanion hole, as well as T-stacking interactions with tryptophan-156. Um, to this aromatic ring. Um, you subsequently have a nucleophilic attack um, by the serine 131 on that bond, which is, actually, is identical in p nitrophenyl butyrate. Um, it releases a compound p nitrophenylate, which fluoresces at 405 nanometers. So um, we identified that the PETase wild type functions optimally at pH 9, although pH 8 is essentially indistinguishable at pH 8. And then we identified the KM and Vmax values for this in our experimental setup. Somewhat remarkably, all of the PETAS variants that we purified actually have better activity than the wild type, which you see on this line here, um, and they approximate that, which is the best one available in the literature. So just to quickly run through these, the best one available in the literature narrows the active site, and these are the KM and Vmax values. You can invite questions later uh, discussing this. Um, for our PETAS variant TANU, which is generated through the machine learning method and has a 22.4% sequence identity, we got a uh, fairly convincing data that it actually does have catalytic activity. Um, same with our DIMI-1 variant. Um, the last two here have slightly better activity than the wild type, but it is still diminished. Um, and one of the reasons that we may think this goods occur because they all have a substitution of the 3 anine at arginine 280. Um, and it, this is unlike DIMI-1, which has some of the best activity of all of our variants. So finally, um, we need to analyze these mutants in uh, the thermostability of these mutants in terms of an industrial setting, because the, uh, that's an important consideration. And we see that all of our mutants um, sustain catalytic activity slightly better than the reigning PETAs, which indicates that they could have industrial applicability. The final hurdle that we have to overcome if we wish to put this in an industrial setting is actual secretion of the enzymes, because then you don't have to worry about lysing the E. coli and going through all those complicated purification steps. So our team hypothesized that this would best be accomplished by the attachment of a LAMB sequence tag, which has been supported in the literature to lead uh, to secretion of the enzyme. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get around to that um, in the time frame of our summer, but we've created the BioBrick, so hopefully a further iGen team will take this project on. Um, and we're currently in the process of confirming the catalytic activity of these enzymes on PET film, because although they cleave key nitrophenyl uh, you don't know if that's necessarily uh, comparable to reality. And finally, the last thing we need to address is the sensitivity of the PETES variants to contamination. All right, and so if you recall, um, Bruno Stranos, the waste management director from U of T, told us that contamination was a big issue. Basically what this means is that if someone throws away their, say, like smoothie into the wrong container, that smoothie contaminates the whole bin, and now that whole bin is no longer recyclable. Since this was not something we could address in either of our labs this summer, um, our PMP team saw this as something that we could address tangibly um, immediately in real life. Um, so how we went about doing this was by raising awareness of recycling practices and the, what will happen if you don't recycle properly. We started by talking to kids because we feel like that's the best way to like brainwash them into recycling properly. And so we went to a little summer camp and we got them to play games. We told them a little bit about synthetic biology. And then recognizing that university students also don't know how to recycle properly, we held an art gala at our university. Um, we talked about um, iGEM in general and we also talked about environmental sustainability and consumer responsibility. Um, and finally, we continued on our podcast from last year. On our podcast, we talked about general issues with synthetic biology. We hosted professors and experts from uh, University of Toronto in the Toronto um, general area. And we also talked about environmental sustainability with experts. Um, and so coming to the end of our um, presentation, we'd just like to show you guys the way that we address each of our information um, goals in some capacity. And finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, everyone that made this possible, including our own team members um, and all of their contributions that got us here today. Um, and then as we move into our question period, we'd like to leave you with this quote. Thank you very much. It was so comprehensive. It was so good. Thank you. So, what was your training data when you were talking about machine learning? Um, I'll turn that over to our trial team to answer that question. Okay. So, Farin, could you repeat that?
the question, please? What was your training method? Oh, yeah. So for appendix, we had 19 sequences. Those were just merely obtained from literature. Um, most of them was from the review paper in, that was published in like 2019 by the same authors that um, discovered the wild type headaches. And then some others were characterized by other labs in, in the States and around the world. So essentially sequences and the function that was related to those sequences. And the function would be characterized by relative um, activity compared to the wild type. So if something was like had two times the activity, that number would just be two. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so can you go back to your validation uh, result? Because I remember that you sh what you show on your PT is uh, the temperature is 30 degree. Yes. But now it changed to 40 degree. Uh, no, these are actually two separate graphs. Um, so this graph initially um, was taken at 30 degrees. Uh, can I have the clear, please? Um, okay, so th this graph here where we initially were assessing the catalytic activity, we chose the temperature of 30 degrees because that is the temperature that, that um, Pettis was originally isolated at, and all of their, all the assays in the Yoshida at all paper were run at. We only wanted to additionally test their activity at 40 degrees for an extended period of time to see that if we actually ended up throwing this Pettis into a bioreactor, would its activity hold up? Like, uh, because a lot of the machine uh, learning, or the machine learning generated Pettis um, had such different sequence identity, we didn't know if it would fall apart, if it would immediately like stop working. Um, so we just thought that this would additionally support the case that our Pettis variant could potentially be used in a bioreactor model. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask is that, do you think there is much probability, if you were to deploy this bioreactor system, of uh, ending up with partially uh, digested PET, and do you know what the implications of that would be? Um, I think that's absolutely a possibility. Um, I, th I think that first, the first thing that we need to take place is actually optimizing the expression of the enzyme. Um, so one of the things is if you attach the LAMB tag to the protein and actually get it secreted, we don't yet know at what rate that would be. We do know like from our experiments in doing periplasmic localization, because it's just such a limited uh, space in order for the protein to accumulate, we had much lower yields than a lot of people in our laboratory that were expressing proteins in the cytoplasm. So we personally as a team would probably Probably recommend a different expression vector in order to maximize the expression of that. Um, however, if you're going to the full extent of creating some sort of microbe that has this integrated into the chromosome, um, you would just be playing around probably with promoters and ribosome binding sites at that point, um, and then uh, probably optimizing that LAMB sequence tag for the best secretion possible. And that may also require optimization of the actual uh, transporters that are exporting it outside the cell. So it, to return to your original question about how to handle um, multiple products being made, I think that that's just like, an unavoidable aspect of the biology. You just have to work at maximizing the amount of headaches that's actually produced, um, and then looking at all the different sequence features that could maybe maximize that as much as possible. Thanks. In the science paper, the given the degradation rate they have shown, how feasible is to degrade at in bioreactor using microorganisms. Okay, so our bioreactor would, we were hoping to actually focus on microplastics because one of the things in the science paper is you see that it takes 40 days um, for approximately, um, I believe what they used in that assay was 50 millimoles of PETAs um, to degrade uh, low crystallinity PET film. Um, so if you're using this in a bioreactor setting, obviously you would already want the, the PET to be degraded to the greatest level possible. So microplastics, you're only just looking at a few uh, monomer, or like a like three pet, four pet, like these slight uh, plastics, whereas like if you have a, a larger piece of film, it'd be much more difficult. So we would anticipate needing a like, uh, what do we call it? Yeah, a mechanical degradation step prior to insertion of these plastics into the bioreactor. Would there have been a feasibility assay considering the rate of plastic trash production versus a reactor running at your rate? That would be a fantastic statistic. Maybe we'll uh, explore that later on. I mean, science part, the work is great in terms of using different tools and different ways of optimizing the protein. That's great, but I am missing a feasibility given the completeness of your project. If not, you can have questions from the audience, if there's any. I guess I was also wondering, uh, 
you know, you talked about the large amount of plastic production in, in Toronto and in Canada. Do you know what percentage of that is actually VAT? Um, so polyethylene terephthalate actually is the most produced, and um, in our conversation with Dan Lance, he's from the uh, company that wants to reduce um, single-use plastic production entirely. But right now, um, Toronto and Canada, and maybe more further than that, are trying to make it so that only um, type one and type two, which are polyethylene and Type one is polyethylene terephthalate. Um, plastics will be the only ones that are allowed to be made in Canada, so it will be applicable. Um, like when that comes into play, right? Because there's the single-use plastics legislation again. I think. Um, so not only the single use, like banning single use plastics legislation, but also um, because maybe just to clarify Kai's point is that we're actually looking at phasing out the other types of plastics, like type three, type four, type five, type six, um, and we're only moving towards polyethylene terephthalate and polyethylene. So it kind of like opens up the market in the sense for other um, strategies for plastic degradation. And again, just to respond to your question, um, I think that again, as Kai mentioned, chemical recycling has a possibility to be infinite. So if you're actually regenerating terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol those could be industrially useful compounds that could enable regeneration of the plastic. So although it may not be on a very large scale that this bioreactor takes place, the virtue lies in the fact that you can regenerate those compounds and they do have commercial viability. Also, I just wanted to mention that in our conversation with Dan Lance, he said that one of the biggest barriers to um, industrial applications of this is like the just really finicky serviceability of uh, headaches and so continued like, research to the same would be like the best way to make it eventually feasible. Well, thank you once more. Give a hand.